Okay, I think so we would start now. Hello everybody and welcome to our third lecture, the Skizenberg Symbiosum. As we have already learned during the presentations by Hesselbrand and Anding, architecture is formed by different types of impacts. Symbiotic processes are not only a bio biological topic, but also a part of our daily life. We can find it in the way we live and interact, but also in the way we create. In our increasingly specialized world, architectural projects often involve many different actors. More than ever, communication and new ideas are incredibly important in the design process and its realization. Therefore, we are excited to welcome Mariana Pipescu tonight, who is going to provide us an insight into her work. Dr. Mariana Popescu is a postdoctoral researcher at the Block Research Group um, at the Institute of Technology and Architecture at ETH Zurich. Um, Popescu is an architect with a strong interest in innovative ways of approaching the fabrication process and use of materials. Her aim is to find a way to build complex structures um, which are efficient and ecologically conscious. Um, her research focuses on the development. Sorry, <laughs> her aim is to find. Um, her research focuses um, on the development of Nitcrete, a new material-saving, labor-reducing, cost-effective formwork system for doubly curved geometries in concrete using 3D knitting. She is the main author of the award-winning Knit Candela Shell and has been included in the MIT. MIT Technology Review Innovator on the 35 list in 2019. Before we hand over the word, we would like to thank our sponsors, the Faculty of Architecture of the KIT and the whole Skizenberg team to make the lectures possible. Speaking of which, we would like to inform the students that we are looking for new members of the Skizenberg team. In this regard, we're going to host a Zoom meeting next Friday at 6 p.m. If you are interested or if you have more questions about it and joining our team, please contact us on Instagram or write us an email instead of writing into the chat. <laughs> well, enough has been said. Now it's your turn, Mariana. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm excited to get to present to such a large audience uh, virtually. Um, so I'll just share my screen so we can start it. Um, so we can start that off. Um, there we go. I hope everyone can see. No, I guess that's not the one. Um, let's try that again. Yes, there we go. Can you see my screen? Uh, correct. Okay, great. Um, so, um, as I said before, thank you very much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. Um, most of the um, most of my talk will be um, a revolving, of course, talking about uh, my research and about uh, specifically the Nit Candela project. But before any of that, I still also want to give you a little bit of an introduction to the context in which this work uh, is being done and to. Uh, and about um, the block research group and some of the pro so the motivation behind the work that we do and some of the projects that are not done by me specifically but that are done within the group that tackle the same kind of um, uh, the same kind of um, problems. So um, at the block research group, we develop um, methods and tools um, to design and build more efficiently, um, keeping uh, material economy in mind. Um, let me just get you. If I put this here, all right, great, <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, with these um, concepts in mind, so efficiency and material economy, uh, we build various demonstrators. They usually showcase um, or explore different aspects of our research philosophy. Um, some of them use less materials, um, either are use ridiculously weak materials and others look at really how we can build differently. And the building differently is uh, the part that will really come back uh, in this talk um, a lot. 
Um, so the a lot of the motivation for that is um, that uh, within the next 30 years, so by 2050, uh, it's projected that the world's population is going to grow um, by about 2.1 billion people. So in the next 30 years, what we're going to have to do is kind of double the stock of housing and infrastructure that we have. So it's not that um, whether we like it or not, we have to build more, we have to build um, these things. And um, if we do, and this has been um, kind of likened um, by Bill and Melinda Gates in 2019 to building uh, one New York City every month for the next 40 years. And um, if you think that's a lot, it is because it is a lot. Um, but it's not only the fact that it's a lot that's problematic, but it's also um, dealing with, um, with our uh, industry, with the construction industry. So um, this is also part of the motivation in the sense that our, everything around us um, is moving forward. Um, everything is being digitized. All of the industries are moving forward, but the construction industry uh, faces quite a few challenges in terms of digitization and in terms of uh, productivity, but especially in terms of the environment. So if we need to build this much, um, we are already quite um, responsible for quite a lot of the pollution. Um, it's very resource uh, intensive what we do. It's not only um, that we're deplete, that we need a lot of resources, but we use a lot of virgin resources. So there's a lot of resource, resource depletion involved in this. Uh, not to mention uh, the fact that we produce, um, as a construction industry, a lot of waste. Um, this comes from not only from demolition, but also just from how we produce things. And of course, in this whole process, we also um, use a lot of energy. So really, to summarize that, um, the industry is responsible for more or less, I mean, the numbers were uh, more specific on the other slides, um, more or less 40% of the energy and process related uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that is a lot. Um, I hope this kind of, this is the motivation for a lot of the things that we do because it underpins it. But I hope it's quite a, enough to convince you that uh, we really need to find ways um, to design structures differently. And we also need to change the way we build structures um, to simply be able to keep up with these things. And um, the way we approach this in the group is um, on the one hand for the design, we do that by uh, having strength through geometry and applying material effectiveness. And on the other hand, the way we uh, build things is um, looking through, we address that through computational design and digital fabrication because um, these things allow us to really build more efficiently. So most of my talk will be uh, centered around the second part. So really digital fabrication and how we can use that to be more efficient in our construction and produce less waste. Um, but of course, um, to understand why we need all of that, I wanted to also talk a little bit about the concept of, of having strength through geometry and material effectiveness. And the best, maybe one of the examples that uh, best portrays these things uh, in, our, um, in our group is the Armadillo Vault, which was um, a stone vault that was built at the Biennale in Venice in 2016. It's a stone structure that stands in pure compression, and it's made out of uh, 399 limestone blocks. Um, these blocks were very precisely fabricated using CNC stone cutting techniques, and um, they were assembled without the need for any mortar. Actually, the entire structure was assembled and disassembled twice um, because of this. There is no glue, there are no special connections. So this shell is really kept together only by gravity. And this is a very important concept. Um, it spans about 16 meters and it's only five centimeters at its thinnest, so on top. So really uh, why I'm showing you this is because it is an extreme example of what you can achieve with these principles. So with the principle of using um, strength through, uh, through geometry, um, really having enough double curvature means you can really make structures that are very, very thin. So they use very little material. But not only that, if you remember, I mentioned that this is a, um, limestone, um, a limestone, which means it's a very weak material. So by really using proper structural principles, having that um, integrated into the design, it means that you cannot, it's not only about using less material, but that you can use a lot weaker material. So the types of materials and impact that has really refers to this material effectiveness. Um, 
before we move on, then the example that I really wanted to give you just to drive this, uh, this structural model home, so to really illustrate that, it's very easy to do it with this kind of example because um, you can surely relate to it, having uh, for sure had a chip in your hand and, uh, and a glass of water, and you could try this at home. Um, so here's a Pringle, which is in, in a very unfortunate loading case. So what it really shows is that um, really good double curvature goes a long way in us being able to produce um, some of these geometries. Now, unfortunately, um, we don't see a lot of these types of structures around, meaning very uh, doubly curved or uh, complex geometries. And that's, um, that may be for many reasons, um, whether it's uh, for uh, architectural reasons or uh, aesthetic reasons, but uh, definitely one of the big roles that has to play in this is uh, simply the way we built. It's absolutely not easy to build, build these structures. So I'm going to take an example, which is a little bit of a classical one, but that might uh, remind you of, uh, of the Pringle that you've seen before. It's a very nice, efficient shell. It was built by Felix Candela uh, in Mexico, and I'm sure uh, most of you um, know this example. If we look at how this was built, I mean, he rationalized these, um, these shapes so that they could be built with ruled uh, surfaces. Um, there is an intelligence in how this is done, in, in being able to do this with straight uh, wooden elements, and not only that, um, really being able to, um, to reuse those elements, those wooden elements. But unfortunately enough, it's still a lot of scaffold, it's still a lot of formwork, it's still a lot of labor that um, maybe in today's world is a little bit difficult to uh, quantify co cost-wise because labor has been, material has become cheaper maybe, but labor has become quite expensive. So uh, if we compare that, which is roughly 60 years ago, to what happens today, is um, we have fine-tuned our, uh, our manufacturing processes and we have definitely become um, better, um, more precise, uh, we can control these a lot, uh, a lot more, but the basics remain the same. So it takes months of milling or carpentry to make these heavy, clunky, and difficult to handle molds. And they ultimately, no matter how we look at it, turn into a pile of waste because for these types of bespoke structures, uh, what usually happens is that we cannot really reuse our, um, our formwork either. So if we really want to um, unlock the full potential of having materially efficient and materially effective structures, we also have to come up with smart ways of building them. It's not a surprise that um, um, if, this, if the waste part of things um, was not uh, enough to convince you, what should also uh, probably make it, drive the point home that formworks are important are the fact that usually in standard construction, they already make, half, make up half of the cost of the, final, of the final concrete structure. And when it comes to custom construction, that comes up to about seven, it could even go as high as 75% of the cost of the structure. And if that were not enough, because 75% is a lot, you, have, you also probably know that these kind of custom constructions are structures that are already three times the cost of the standard one to begin with. So that's really um, quite an important chunk of our construction. So really, it becomes quite important to reduce the waste, the cost, and the time that we associate with building these structures. Um, and it's no surprise that a lot of research um, has gone into finding better ways of uh, addressing formwork. And this has happened both in research, both in academia and in industry. So um, some of these techniques range from really looking at how we can uh, produce uh, precise but very lightweight molds. So really um, through milling and cutting, but really looking at uh, making them very lightweight so they're easy to handle. Um, reusable molds, adaptable molds, so that they can be reused and reconfigured. 3D printing, um, it makes it possible to create kind of whatever we want. Um, you can address the problem of undercuts. Really, geometry is for free in that case, so we really can do whatever we want. And um, finally, there have also been quite a lot of uh, projects that look into how uh, formwork can actually just stay in place and become either become an active part of the structure, so become reinforcement or, some, or fulfill some other sort of function, whether it's structural or not structural. Uh, but that it doesn't go to waste. 
Um, another one of, um, those are the classical approaches and then there's a different type of approach which is um, maybe less common um, and that is to really look into flexible formworks. Um, flexible formworks usually use a, a membrane of sorts that is being tensioned or pulled um, or draped into the shape that, uh, that we want and then that is used as formwork. This can be done by either draping over normal, uh, over wooden frames, uh, by inflating it, um, by uh, supporting it with cables or splines um, and just simply wooden formworks. So um, the type of approach that I'm talking about today is part of this, um, is part of these flexible formwork systems because actually in moving away from the traditional rigid formwork system to a flexible one, we have, um, we address most of the challenges that come with, uh, with concrete construction in the sense that um, the, the membrane or the fabric uh, is a lot lighter than wood, it produces um, a lot less waste, it needs a lot less support. So really what we're doing is we're getting rid of this. Ooh, can you see my mouse actually? Let's see. Ah. Um, then what we're doing is really getting rid of all of this uh, red part over here. We need less supports there. Of course, this, this type, of, um, this type of drawing is a little bit of a caricature, so it's just to really illustrate this. Um, and there's another caveat there with the rigid uh, formwork systems on the right, what, we usually, what usually happens is if you manage to manufacture the system, so if you manage to manufacture that mold, however you do it, you will be able to build that structure. So it's kind of a little bit of a brute force approach. However, the structure on the right you cannot just make whatever shape you want. So there is a limitation to it. You need to take into account that it is a tension system, a flexible system. So it has some limitations, but um, there is a, an advantage that is hidden into this limitation in the sense that it forces us to design better structures, lighter ones and ones that have good geometry so that we can also build them um, in, a, in a better way. Now, um, in changing the, uh, the system from a rigid and flexible uh, to a flexible one, um, we're really able to bring back um, efficient, the efficient building of, of uh, thin uh, concrete structures, elegant ones, doubly curved ones, like the one that you see here. So this is actually um, a project that uh, has been, has been uh, developed in the group for, uh, for a number of years, and it deals with these formworks. It's um, the Nest Hilo, um, um, Shell. Now the Nest Hilo unit is developed um, for a Nest together with other research groups at ETH um, and Hilo stands for a high performance and low embodied operational energy. So um, it can be done by combining lightweight structures with low energy building systems and the good, uh, a good example of that is actually the roof. Um, so um, that happens um, on this uh, Nest, which is an innovation platform created by EMPA in Dubendorf in Switzerland. It's really a chance for research institutes to implement and test their work in a real world, world conditions and together with industry. So uh, the unit uh, goes on the, on the right there where the big question mark is um, and, it looks, um, and it looks a little bit like this. So actually the prototype you saw before is uh, what's happening now on site. It's just been decentered. It's this uh, shell roof that you see uh, rendered here. So if we just take a quick look at how that uh, works, it's to create this kind of structure. Um, what you do, what, um, what we did is um, create um, a cable net um, that supported a textile. I, the cable net was tensioned into this, um, these wooden boundary conditions that are held up by standard scaffolding. Um, that cable net is the main load bearing uh, structure, but it's a flexible system that's covered with, uh, with a fabric. And then that fab on that fabric, we can cast the concrete. And here's just an impression of what that looked like uh, in the full scale prototype that we built uh, two years ago, well, three years ago, just to, um, to prove that this kind of system works. Um, so on the top left, you'll see the cable net that's very easy to assemble. It, it really just, it was a kit of parts with nodes and, uh, and steel cables that could really be assembled with two people and Manitous. So there's this, this lightness of how, uh, how one can work. Um, then you can see the fabric that is both, both on top um, and, on, and the cable net on the bottom holding it up. And then the casting, uh, the casting of the shell back then. And this is what it looked like when, uh, 
when it came on site. So this, uh, that was the test. This is being, um, had been done on site in the, um, in the summer uh, of last year before, um, well, in spring, actually, before, um, before, no, in the summer, before we needed to stop for winter. Um, but here you can see the cable net being held up by the, um, by the temporary supports. Um, of course, there are some, uh, in order to make sure that these types of uh, structures really hit the, sp uh, the spot, really hit their geometry, um, system control systems and also photogrammetry systems were developed together with other colleagues um, at ETH from, uh, from the photogrammetry group and the um, um, uh, robotic systems uh, lab. Um, here you can see the fabric being put on top of that cable net and being pulled taut. Um, and then these are just some impressions of what that looked like uh, in the end from the bottom. So you can see the geometry. Uh, here you can see what, um, what this looked like in, uh, in, a casting, um, in a casting scenario. So here you can see the concrete being sprayed on. Um, but really what, um, uh, what this is meant to do is show you um, what, uh, what comes out of it. So this is the decentered cell. Um, um, roof after the formwork and the boundary uh, conditions have been removed. So this is on site at the moment. So you can really see it's a, it's a beautiful concrete structure that was really lightly built with this type of flexible formwork system. There's a lot of intelligence that goes into the nodes, which you can still see on the, on the concrete, and in making sure that these kind of uh, features for where the facade uh, um, is coming are really controlled. So um, this project um, is also interesting, actually, because um, building demonstrators uh, is not enough. So if we really want to have an impact um, we, on construction, we also uh, want to share our research results openly. So we do this through Compass, which is a computational framework developed within the group, and we share that completely open source. Um, so. Um, this was also one of the prototypes where this really came um, came as a as a glue as a way to really show that you can work together and where computational uh, methods really came together uh, very importantly. So in this project, of course, um, it's obviously a little bit more complicated when it's at this kind of scale and when you need to work with industrial partners. Um, partners, so. Um, these systems were really developed together with uh, other ETH research uh, groups and with industry partners so that um, it could be really smoothly done on site. So it's really the, the kind of computational pipeline that is at the core of these types of projects. Now, um, to come to the, um, to the core of the presentation, really, um, what I wanted to talk uh, most about today is, is, the work, is the work that I do, which is um, based on the same type of types of principles. So really looking at computation, but also at flexible formwork systems, much like the ones that you've seen so far and motivated by the same kind of, um, by the same kind of um, uh, reasons. Um, but it is specifically looking at knitted flexible formworks. And why we picked um, knitting is because um, knitting has um, several uh, opportunities and advantages. So um, those, um, you can create 3D shapes uh, directly in one process. It doesn't need um, a lot of stitching or gluing or putting things together. So if you think of your clothes, uh, how they are tailored, that's normally how you would get a 3D shape from a textile. You get a flat sheet of material, you cut it, you sew it together, and you get the shape that you want. With knitting, you can do that directly in one, uh, in one kind of process. And you can do a lot of things. You can do branching. You can have channels and uh, pockets and openings and um, spacer fabrics. So spacer fabrics are ones that have a thickness. Um, and really, the most imp one of the very um, interesting parts is that you can have tailored material uh, placement. So if you look on the bottom right, um, you have this kind of uh, lacy, um, lacy example. It makes you think of your grandmother's sweaters, probably. But um, it's really because um, with knitting, you can do these types of uh, thickening and thinning and having a, a direction to, your, uh, to where you place your material that is a lot easier to do than with other material processes. And it's not necessarily that um, one of these um, 
that other types of textiles cannot do these things. So uh, 3D shaping or branching or um, having some material properties. It's actually the combination of all of them that can be brought into one that is very powerful uh, about it. So um, if this head doesn't convince you, what the best way to relate to it is to think of your shoes. Think of your running shoes that have all of these uh, channels and cables and uh, materials already integrated into it. So um, how does this type of system work? Um, we start with the design. We fabricate a fitting textile using existing knitting machines. And then we shape that textile by tensioning it using temporary supports, much like you've seen in the previous project. And then um, the difference is that in this case, it's coated with a very specifically designed thin cement paste just to give it that initial stiffness. And that's because knits are actually a lot softer than any other textiles. So you really want to give it an initial rigidity. Um, and the result that comes out of that is kind of a very lightweight rigid structure, which can be used as a formwork. So, uh, one of the tricky parts is the uh, is getting from a design to your actually fa fabricated textile. Um, so, depending on how big your um, your structure is, you would still need to to split that up into different pieces, of course. Um, and then for each one of those pieces, you need to figure out the instructions to give the knitting machine, in this case, the machine, the knitting machine in this case, uh, to fabricate those. And those instructions are uh, knitting patterns. So we. We will come back to uh, that later. Now, once the textile has been fabricated, the next tricky step is to go from the actual textile to the last um, to the last step where it becomes a formwork. And now that part can be um, approached in two different ways. So, on the one hand, um, textiles are really light, uh, not not knit specifically. Any textiles, they're very light. You can compact them. You can uh, put them in a box. Uh, and ship them, transport them very lightly to the site. And there um, you can tension and coat them in a frame and have uh, your formwork. The other option would be to say, okay, all of the individual uh, discretized pieces of my uh, components of my design, those can be uh, lightly manufactured in a uh, prefabricated environment. So we tension them and coat them in a uh, environment. And then those components, which are still very lightweight because they're just a thin textile with a coating on top, those get transported to site where they get assembled uh, to make the formwork finally on site. So whichever route we choose, um, the result is actually um, a formwork that we can cast the final concrete structure in. So before we go uh, further, what I wanted to really look at is um, how, um, how knits manage to make these 3D shapes and why they are interesting for that. So um, if we take a closer look at the knit itself, um, fa knitted fabrics are created through interlocking of consecutive loops, much like you see here. Um, this is done um, with a needle which catches the yarn and pulls it through previously formed loops. I will show you this later, but um, that's um, the unit is, uh, is this loop. Um, and um, it's also defined by a, um, a width, oh, you cannot see anymore, by a width uh, and a height, because all of those loops have that. And um, what you can already see I'm hinting at here is that you, we could abstract this kind of uh, knitted textile to a matrix or a grid of loops that are uh, consecutively made one after the other. Now, why uh, we can shape these knits is because um, if we wanted to create just a, um, a varying width, uh, all we need to do is go and add. Uh, so say we wanted to do something like this. All we need to do is add some loops from row to row. And there are specific operations in knitting that do this. And these are called increases or remove a loop combining two of them so that we remove them from row to row. So those are called decreases, which really allows us to make this kind of shaping. So it's great, um, but this is still leaves us with a flat piece, right? It's just a shaped flat piece. So say we wanted to um, make a 3D geometry, create a bump. Um, what you see here is that um, the length on the back and the length on the front um, are completely different, but our base matrix, the one that we've seen before in terms of courses, is the same. So what we really need to do is, similarly to before, 
try to find a way to introduce material <laughs> locally so that we can get that length uh, on, on the front, but that doesn't go all the way to the back. Um, and that can be done by adding loops, but just not all the way through on that course. And this local adding of material is also called a short row or, um, or an incomplete row um, or an incomplete course. And this is um, really the core of why, um, why we can do, uh, make 3D geometries without stitching. Because if you see this, uh, this image, normally if you wanted to do this out of flat pieces, what you would do, you would cut the, uh, there where you see the blue lines, you would add that piece of material and have two stitches there. But in this case, that just happens as a normal process on the, on the machine. So um, just to give you an idea, this is what the industrial machine then looks like. Um, this head moves across those needles. If we take a closer look at that, um, every time there are, um, there's not just one needle, but there are an array of needles um, that catch this uh, thread that's been brought by the yarn guide. Now, just to look a little bit closely, this is actually how that Sorry? This is, uh, this is actually um, how that happens. So with, with each pass, um, that loop can be formed. And now the interesting part is that the machine actually has two, um, two needles facing each other. So you, can create, um, so you can create loops both in the front and the back, and you can use multiple needles. So in this case, we just created uh, one textile on the one side, but uh, you can uh, jump from front to back to create this kind of rib. It's what you recognize maybe from, the, um, from your cuffs on your, on your sweaters. That's the kind of pattern that this makes. What you could also do is use two, specific, two different threads, uh, one on the front and one on the back, and that creates kind of two different, uh, two different textiles or those tailored material properties that are separate. Now these instructions, uh, the machine, in order to do this, needs uh, these instructions. They really look um, like a pixel grid where every row uh, represents um, one pass of the machine and every pixel in that row represents the working of one needle. Now the colors on those uh, that you see on those patterns uh, tell that needle what action to do on that specific pass. So if we have a closer look at that, um, just at the pattern, um, it looks something like this. And uh, except for the colors that I mentioned before that they just represent uh, an action that the needle has to do. You also see these kind of white patches where nothing is happening. And that means that it's just telling the needles do not do anything here. So here you can see actually a, a sort of example of that short row, so that in, insertion of extra material, because we have here loops that are being created, but not here. And the minute we get to this row and we add these ones here, they get connected to this one and they create a bump in your, um, a bump or a turn in your textile. So these kind of, um, of um, patterns usually um, are defined like unit by unit um, by uh, technicians, very skilled technicians that have to imagine where to place all these features, right? So we have to think of where we might want to add or remove material in order to get the geometry that we want. Now, that is very easily done for something that is a little bit of a sphere or a, or a turn, uh, like the ankle of your, uh, of your socks, because you can very easily imagine or have a mathematical formula for, for these kind of shapes. So if I told you make a sphere, you would easily think of, uh, of a beach ball and think where to remove material, the same for a turn. But this becomes really, really a lot more complicated if we start to look at um, the scale of architecture, so a lot bigger uh, surfaces, and the fact that um, those are not necessarily defined by primitives. So doing this by hand would still become an, a, a nightmare and a little bit of a, a, of a, um, a, of a bottleneck for construction, um, which is why it's actually quite important to be able to find a way to go from a 3D design um, to the knitted object, so to the instructions. So the tricky part is really to develop a computational pipeline that automatically translates that 3D design into instructions for a knitting machine. So um, very quickly, I would say, um, I would give you an impression of how that's done. So that is part of the research that I did is that um, we start with a 3D geometry. Now, depending on how large that geometry is, it's split up into different parts, this patching step, 
Um, for each one of those parts, all of the passes of the machine, so all of the rows are generated in the first, uh, in the first step. Then for each one of those rows, the number of loops in the rows are generated. And this is all done directly in 3D, so on your 3D geometry. And then that 3D, um, uh, 3D um, generated pattern, which is actually just a network, a graph network, or a remeshing of quads and, um, and triangles, can then be translated into a 2D knitting pattern. Um, I'll just quickly give you an example just for a piece, just to illustrate that. So um, if we begin uh, with a geometry like this, for each one of the patches, we would know the size of the loop that we're creating with our machine. So we have the width and the height of it. And we also know, we also pick a knitting direction because again, it was a directional process. So we create all of those uh, courses. So in the first step, we know the start and the end and we can produce all of, the, um, uh, all of the passes of the machine because we know the height of the loop. Now, uh, because this is a 3D geometry, it means that not all of those passes can be complete because if they were complete, then we would just have a flat piece of textile. So um, not all of those passes go all the way through. And you see here, um, the ones that are highlighted in blue that are actually short or incomplete rows where we have this local placement of material. Now in the next step, we do the same in the other direction, but knowing um, all of the um, loop widths. So we sample our, uh, our courses with the loop widths and we can find out all of the individual loops that we have for each one of those courses. Now, um, in this case, that can be then translated to your 2D diagram where, for example, the uh, triangular parts uh, represent the start and the end of one of these short rows. And in the other direction, um, the triangular parts represent um, an increase, so where we want to add more uh, materials, or a decrease, where we want to combine, uh, combine uh, loops back together. So if we have this automated pipeline to create these, 3D, uh, these patterns for a 3D geometry, then the next thing that we need to do is figure out a way to get from that, uh, from that knitted um, artifact to the actual formwork itself. So for this, we... Um, did a lot of, uh, we created a lot of um, different, um, different prototypes at different scales. So these were either component scales or um, moving up to a little bit bigger, um, small um, prototype bridges. Um, and really the project that I wanted to show was actually the one that shows not only that we can do this, but that we can do this at a reasonable scale. So that would be uh, the Nit Candela prototype. So, um, Nit Candela, as the name suggests, uh, is inspired by the uh, famous uh, shell builder, uh, Felix Candela. It was built in uh, Mexico City at the Museum of um, Contemporary Art uh, in Mexico City. Um, and it was done in collaboration with Zaha Hadid Architects. Um, it's built uh, also on a cable net and a fabric formwork. So the same type of principle that, uh, that was used in the first first project that I, uh, that I showed you, so in the uh, nest hilo roof. But in this case, uh, the textile is left in place, which is what you see here. Uh, and what is also specifically interesting about the project is that it is a, um, that it is a waffle shell. So um, meaning that it is a stiffened, uh, a thin shell structure stiffened by ribs. So there were two challenges here. One was to create the global double curve, <laughs> curved geometry of the formwork. And then the other challenge was to create all of the little cavities. So the local uh, complexity of a formwork. Um, how we did this, just to, to quickly show you, is we built an external frame. In that frame, we tensioned a textile and a cable net, the cable net being the ma main load bearing part. But, um, the textile already had um, channels and grooves where we could pass these cables through and control their position and also pockets uh, which we um, added balloons to so that it becomes inflatable. Those, pocket, those inflatable balloons would create the cavities in the, in the structure but um, to give it that initial rigidity we coated it only on one side with a specially designed cement paste. Uh, once this hardened we could cast the concrete on top of that and once the concrete hardened, um, the frame can be removed, uh, leaving just the structure behind. And of course, the balloons can be deflated because they have no more purpose now. And they are left in place. 
So what you see here is um, that blue line that is left in place is the textile that you actually see on the inside of, uh, of the pavilion. That means that our uh, formwork had um, to, per to uh, fulfill two functions. On the one hand, it had to fulfill a technical function, that of being able to put the cables in the right place, uh, to really hold its shape and have and control the, the size of the, uh, the cavities and the sides to which the uh, balloons inflated. And on the other hand, it was going to be left in aesthetically, so it has this aesthetic side uh, that has just a color pattern designed onto it. So if we really look at the uh, front and the back face side by side, we see that they are uh, different both in color, so in color meaning in material. At, the, at this point in time, yes, it is the same material, but it could be a different material. But not only that, you can see that the back side looks sp sp quite different to the front. The front having just a hint of the structure that's behind, whereas the back has um, the channels, the openings um, at the nodes of the cables. It is a lot looser, so you can see the pocket that would uh, that would really um, see to control to which side this inflation occurs. So they are really uh, different, but they are created in one single piece. So this is not. Um, several pieces that are being stitched to the, together. It is one single process that creates all of these features in one go. Now, of course, if we have a look at that uh, machine, um, it does have its limitations. Um, one of the first obvious ones is the width. So you can really just imagine it as a giant plotter where you could uh, go infinitely long, but you are only limited to the width of the machine. So we took advantage of this limitation of the machine and we divided our structure into strips, into four strips, actually, which meant that uh, we only had five seams over the, um, uh, four seams over the entire structure. So um, for this, we then um, generated the patterns for each one of those, uh, for each one of those strips. This is just a very quick video. Oop just a very quick video that shows you kind of what these, uh, what that looked like as a, as a, um, um, whoop, we're going back somewhere, I guess, I hope. Um, well, actually, if we look at the, um, the different, uh, yeah, there we go with the generation again. And this is what one of those patterns ended up looking like. We had seen this uh, earlier in the explanation and what you can see here are actually all of, these little white cuts. And those are all of those short rows that you can imagine now have a lot more material on the one side and a lot less material on the other. So it really creates this bending um, in the textile. I just wanted to quickly have a look um, at a, just one portion of it to help you understand why it's possible to do this all on, uh, all on, mach all on the machine and have this kind of double-sided textile. So if we look at the pattern here, and we look at the backs uh, at the back of the textile. We can see how that um, what is represented as a channel, more or less. Um, we can see what is a vertical channel. We can see the pattern um, that creates that opening in the uh, in the textile, and we can see um, the same things uh, over on the front face. So very quickly, um, why that works is because we used two. Um, uh, both of the beds of the machine and each one of those um, instructions actually tells you to use two yarn guides and to do this on both sides of the machine. So we're creating that in parallel um, at the same time. So for example, you can knit only on the front and uh, or only on the back and not on the front. Um, you can knit on the front and on the back uh, or we, you can switch which uh, thread knits on the front and which one goes on the back. So we can send the blue to the front and send the black to the back. Um, you can also transfer uh, one loop from the front to the back, closing it uh, together or uh, drop stitches. And that's just to really show you that all of these kind of operations are what enable us to make all of these features in the textile. So if we really see um, these things uh, side by side, just quickly to show you how it works, is if we see multiple of these functions, one next to each other, you can start to understand why it's possible to create these uh, pockets and one single textile without stitching. So for example, here you can see the blue and the black thread, how they change within one row from the front and the back. And you can see that a pocket starts to emerge there where they intersect. Now these instructions um, go then to the machine. 
in this particular case, um, it produced, uh, we produced the four pieces uh, in what is um, arguably the world's largest scarf. Uh, we packed those uh, four pieces into vacuum bags um, so that we can take them uh, to Mexico in our suitcases because they only weighed 25 kilos. And of course, because we're architects, we only finished this the night before we needed to leave. Um, so um, there we were with a lot of textile going in our suitcases to Mexico. In the meantime, this is on site. Uh, you can see a glimpse of the frame that is being built outside and us camping on the, on the corridors of the museum um, and having put the pieces, uh, all of the four pieces together. So what you see here on the ground are the four uh, separate pieces that had been sewn together. Um, this was done literally in an afternoon by a seamstress that was actually very happy to, for once, not work on wedding dresses um, and just be part of this uh, crazy construction, uh, construction project. Here you can see us uh, putting the cables through their respective channels. We fix them in place temporarily with zip ties um, just to make sure that the nodes are where they should be. And we took it outside, we put it around the middle pole of that, uh, of that frame, and we had a lot of uh, nice students from UNAM that were um, very eager to help us um, in constructing this, as well as construction workers on site. Um, and we hoisted this up. Now, it might look like this is very heavy, it's not. The entire package was 55 kilos. So the textile and the cable net with everything inside of it was only 55 kilos, but we were doing it for the very first time. So we were being really, really careful on how we were tilting this thing, uh, this thing up into position. And of course, then we could uh, take a, a nice uh, breath of relief to see that that tiny textile that looked like it would never stretch to that size actually does stretch to the size that we wanted. And you get a glimpse here of the lightness of this formwork then, because um, if you were supposed to um, create this out of uh, milling foam, for example, um, this entire space would be filled with, uh, with scaffolding and the foam blocks. And I'm not even sure I would know exactly how to make that. So um, that's the inside. Um, here is just a, um, a glimpse of what the outside looked before we um, added the, uh, the balloons, the inflatable balloons. Um, a nice feature that we added here is um, um, a little profile that was clamped onto the, uh, onto the cables that held up the edge of the textile um, in order to, for us to know exactly to where the concrete needed to go once, the, once we started casting and to give it a nice um, finish at the end. Um, here you can see the very uh, precise process of adding uh, the balloons to the, uh, to the um, um, to the, uh, to the knit. And we did this to create those cavities. After adding all of those, um, all of those balloons to each one of those pockets, what we did is we coated it with a very uh, specific cement paste. That cement paste was developed by Lex, which you see here. Lex is my colleague from, uh, from the Department of uh, Physical Chemistry of Building Materials. And what he did here was really uh, make come up with this, uh, with this very specific cement paste that could be used outdoors, that was very light and could just coat the entire textile to give it a, the first stiffness that we were talking about. So after coating it, it looks a little bit like a Swiss chocolate, something like this. And this is really the rigidified uh, formwork. Now, what I wanted to point out here was that those balloons that went into all of those pockets create the cavities later in the structure. But what is also interesting to note here is that you can see that they are all different sizes. So usually when it comes to digital fabrication, what the paradigm is that um, that everything is easy because a machine doesn't, that customization is easy because a machine doesn't really care if you're making the same part a uh, hundred times or if you're making a slightly different part a hundred times. And that is really powerful. But one of the bottlenecks there is then labeling and making sure on site when you're building things that you put the right part in the right place. So this kind of logistics problem in this case, the knit really takes care of that is has the intelligence because it has the size of the, of the different pockets. And not only does it have the size of the different pockets, it also controls how much they inflate and what size they are. So we really had this, a thousand times the same balloon that we put into those pockets and we still got 500 different types of, uh, of pockets uh, of cavities that are all different. Okay, 
So with this uh, lovely Swiss chocolate done, what we had is actually a new canvas that we, um, that we um, delivered to the, um, to the uh, construction workers that were really glad to be able to show their craft on this because this type of project is really um, in some ways only really possible in Mexico. They have a serious tradition, a seriously good tradition of working with, uh, with concrete so they're really um, construction masters of putting, uh, of, of doing this, uh, these concrete structures. So uh, we did that also in layers and you can see them here really uh, smoothing that out. And they did a fantastic job because by the end of it, it was so smooth that you would almost not tell it's concrete. I think Candela would have been proud of it as well. Um, so the, um, the imp last impression of the finished structure here is really to see this contrast be behind the, uh, the hard concrete exterior and the soft textile interior. What you don't see on the images is that actually behind this textile are cavities. So if you were there and you would push onto it, it was soft. So it's literally a soft interior. And every now and then, uh, depending on how the sun would shine, you could also see those cavities and the skeletons of the balloons left behind. Um, so um, these are just some final impressions of the structure and I wanted to leave you with some um, with some final thoughts on it. So some takeaways from the project. In, um, in doing so, the formwork, so really the um, textile and the cable net, um, but excluding the frame, which could be reusable, so excluding that uh, scaffolding only cost a total of about 2,300 uh, euros. Um, it weighed 55 kilos, of which 25 uh, only were the, um, the textile. It was so light that we really could take it in our checked-in bags. And unfortunately, we did not fly business, so we did need two bags instead of just one. Um, but um, one of the really nice uh, parts of this, or at least one of the parts that I really like, is that it took about 36 hours to knit those four pieces, and um, they are a total of about 50 square meters. And it would have taken roughly 750 hours to produce EPS molds, so milling and coating and everything that needs to be done in order to be able to do a normal, um, not a normal, a usual EPS mold uh, for the same um, surface area. So um, the project actually from beginning, so from the first time that um, Zahadid Architects sent an email about it to the structure actually uh, standing there uh, was three and a half months. And if you remember those uh, 750 hours, that's roughly three months of continuous milling or working on, on the formwork. So really with traditional, um, with traditional techniques, this would, would have really been impossible in this kind of short time. So um, what we're doing now is um, taking this further and really trying to see how this could be um, applied in a more, um, in a more day-to-day -day scenario um, and also how it could be improved. We're working, uh, for example, together with uh, colleagues at ETH from um, Professor Val uh, Walter Kaufmann's group on including reinforcement um, because till now the formwork that stays in place may be beautiful, but um, it, it's lost. Um, it doesn't fulfill any other function uh, at the moment. Um, so we're really looking into how we can use these uh, strategies to include reinforcement, to guide reinforcement, and really have that as part of it. Uh, we're also looking at how, um, what types of materials might be used, um, how, what types of coatings might, uh, might be used there, how we can address uh, concepts of sustainability and circularity, um, because productivity um, is somehow showcased until now, but the rest of them would be nice to be uh, implemented as well. And um, not only that, but really looking at how we apply concrete. So um, how do we um, automate that? How do we do that also in contexts where we don't have maybe the skilled labor or where we don't want people to, um, to fulfill those jobs or where they simply cannot because they cannot be reached. So we are looking at automated processes for that as well. But finally, um, actually, I've always shown you just one of one machine. Um, it's not a very special machine. So what's really powerful about this is that, um, yes, we can bring things there in our suitcases, but having a computational pipeline, we actually have the, um, 
the power to deploy this on a large scale because there are factories with hundreds of these machines that are just ready to knit whatever we want all over the world. So we don't even need to transport that textile anywhere. We can just create it on demand. So um, I think with that, um, I can finish my presentation. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, first of all, for your uh, fascinating lecture. Um, I think we've got a really, um, really good insight in what, uh, what your research includes. And um, yeah, now we would like to open up the discussion. So are there any questions from the audience? Um, please feel free to unmute or um, write the questions in the chat. What is um, what is like uh, at the end? You you said that you to look how to to apply the information that you took out of the project into a more daily based um, day to day structure. Can you maybe give a an outlook on how it how 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 a building that could be built on a daily basis um, if that technique could look like or could work? Um, sure. So, um, actually what we, we, what we really look into is, um, kind of pragmatic solutions. Every time you, uh, create one of these, um, projects, of course, it's to show the extreme, to be able to show that you can really do this type of, um, um, double curvature or special, uh, structures. But um, one of the very simple things that we're looking into now is how to create very controlled, more conventional section, um, sections for beams, for example. Um, so um, that are um, maybe triangular, maybe. What I didn't, uh, what I couldn't show you uh, yet is actually we are working on a project um, for, um, uh, which was supposed to be done by now, but unfortunately, Corona hit, so we didn't. Uh, it was a pavilion. Uh, it was a pavilion that we would be building at the Maxi Museum in Rome, and it's inspired by uh, Pierluigi Nervi. So it has this kind of diagrid of more um, of more um, controlled and usual geometries, where you have a triangular section, so not a um, not a fluid section, but a very controlled uh, sharp edges uh, section that we can also check with. Uh, how you could do this with the with the textile. Um, other uh, ideas are actually that we're investigating are um, really into looking into the reinforcement of just very simple beams that are produced this way, and um, how that could be done in a more prefabricated context. So uh, combining um, maybe custom nodes or custom um, or custom solutions for those uh, parts of a building that need to be that needs to be different and then combine those with standard prefabricated um, uh, objects. Does this answer your question? Yeah, it does, it does. It's a bit, it's a bit vague, but... Um... Okay, so then there's another question in the chat and um, they wanted to know which kind of material you used for the knitting. Um, in this case, it's a very simple PES fiber, uh, which is the most uh, common uh, fiber you can find, uh, polyester fiber. Uh, the re so you can, it's just an off-the-shelf one. Um, the reason we chose that was because it's an outside um, application, so um, we wanted this in quite a lot of sunlight, so it was UV resistant, so it wouldn't fade. Um, and also um, it had alkali resistance because the fibers that you use with concrete should have alkali resistance. Now it's true that in this particular case that doesn't matter that much because it doesn't fulfill a structural um, uh, role and um, so that's okay, but in general these. We are also um, now doing experiments uh, with um, aramid fiber, glass fiber, and carbon fiber uh, for the textile, for the reinforcement part of things. Um, but in general, you can use um, whatever fiber or fabric or textile, that yarn that can pass through the machine. So the, op so the opportunities are really limitless. Um, in that sense. 
Uh, so we've got another one in the chat. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the lecture. It was really interesting. But do you think that it is possible to work with less concrete since it's not the most sustainable? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So, um, I mean, there are um, two parts to that question, I believe. So um, one is um, whether um, working with less. I think working with less in general is uh, the answer. So we need to use less material. Um, but um, there is a caveat. Um, if the second part of the question is if we should not be working with concrete at all, because or or uh, less because it's not sustain, it's not the most sustainable. Um, I agree that we should be using less, but there is a um, concrete itself is not a uh, not such a bad material. I actually have some slides for this if you want. It's not such a bad material. It's actually more sustainable in many ways than other materials. So it's more sustainable than steel. It's more sustainable than other materials that we use. The problem is we use a lot of it. So the main reason that it's insanely unsustainable and really bad for our planet is because we use a, a lot, a lot of it. Um, so um, let me see if I can find this just so that I can, uh, I'll share my screen again if I do find it um just to um because i have a nice little um there we go so i can um let's see i'll share my screen again can you see it yes so if you uh if you have a look there you'll see that uh, as embodied energy goes <laughs> per unit of mass uh, concrete is not that bad um, so I'm, it's just right there. I'm trying to find my mouse now, but it's just uh, somewhere here at the at the bottom. Uh, it's a lot uh, better than even some of the woods <laughs> that you can find out there. Um, and um, so the problem really is, um, and here's another chart, hopefully, of that. So um, this is um, kind of where concrete is at. Um, maybe straw, stone, and uh, timber is better, but compared to all the oh, sorry, <laughs> compared to all the other, uh, compared to all the other materials, I'll just put this a little bit higher. Compared to all of the other materials, it's actually not that bad. Um, so, really, the take-home message there is that we need to use a lot less. The reason it's so bad is because it's being used a lot. Oh, I'll stop screen sharing now. <laughs> Um, so maybe we've got another question. Um, I mean, it is certain that for a lot of architectural projects, um, especially for um, complex ones, uh, as the ones you uh, presented, um, you need to bring knowledge of different people together because otherwise it wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible. Um, so what we are interesting, what we were interested in as well when we um, develop the topic of uh, the serious um, symbiosis is um, how could like how does these collabor collaborations look like uh, what kind of specializations do you have in your group and yeah how do you bring these different views together as well um, so it is actually quite clear that we cannot do any of these things in silos so we cannot work uh, just as separate uh, engineers and uh, architects and material scientists and all come at a different point in time in the project and then it becomes no it's really something that um, if we want to really improve things um, this has to be an integrated uh, part of design from the very get-go. So really we need new professionals that can really tackle all of these kind of um, complexities, but not that you, not all in one, but just that can all really uh, understand these and work together. Um, in our group specifically, we are a mixture of architects and structural engineers. So we, we have kind of two hats uh, all the time. Um, that's um, also um, very important uh, are the computational tools. So all of us are um, quite computational. But it doesn't stay, these kind of projects do not stay within the group. I, I think I kind of, I hope I, I managed to show that actually also uh, throughout the presentation that it, it happens a lot through collaboration. So um, we don't only um, 
do the architecture and structure part of things and the computational part, but we really need uh, material scientists, as is, for example, um, Lex that I mentioned earlier, my colleague that developed the thin cement paste. Um, maybe in the uh, other projects, uh, you have roboticists that take care of, uh, that really can um, contribute to the control part because, uh, you know, when you when you design something, it's one thing. When you get on site, it's for sure not going to be the the thing that you designed. So you really need to make sure that you hit that. Um, we need different algorithms. We need different uh, approaches. So it's really usually a very collaborative process with experts from different fields. Um, in the case of um, Nit Candela, it's been it it has been um, mainly or of this approach, it's mainly um, the structural and architectural part from our group, and then uh, the material science that really um, helps. Uh, that really helps it. Okay. Are there more questions from the audience? Uh, yes, I have one question. Um, how do you choose the specific form of the object? Is it by the purpose of the uh, project, or is it by the um, technical possibilities? So uh, it's both. It has, uh, so the way um, we go about it is that you uh, design with a system in mind. So in this case, it was uh, designed with a system in mind and having uh, in mind that it's supposed to be a dem demonstration for a certain way of building and for how to make this. So for example, um, some of the constraints for the design are um, having a quad mesh. Um, because you want to have a cable net because you've decided for a system that has a cable net. I mean, it's not that it can't be something else, but it was just one of the <laughs> one of the constraints that makes it simpler uh, to say we're only going to have a quad mesh. That's something that goes into that. So you really do inform your design with the constraints that come from the building system in this case. Um, the geometry, uh, there are two parts to that. Uh, on the one hand, um, of course, um, it is inspired by, uh, by Candela, so it has some uh, architectural um, considerations to it, the being a, being, um, a rotational uh, symmetry, having these kind of uh, openings and, uh, and dips, that's more of an, it's a little bit of an aesthetic choice as well. But then, of course, the geometry is not something uh, only designed to be that geometry, so kind of loose, but it's form found. So it's um, it's done in such a way that you can, um, with uh, in this case with um, with force uh, with the force density method, so that you can actually find the cable net, the geometry that is most efficient with the less uh, the least amount of forces for that kind of system. So it's really um, it's really a combination of things, both of design intent and um, system and constraints and being uh, structurally um, efficient. Thanks. And we have another question in the chat. <laughs> what happens if you are building outside and the fabric material gets wet? So if it rains or if it snows? Um, actually, we were building in, um, in uh, Mexico during the rain season, which was a little bit, uh, which was a little bit of a funny part. Um, so that's why, that's why we were inside. Um, nothing really happens. <laughs> um, it's just that uh, the water brings a lot of weight with it. So you might not want that because you just don't want, given that you have such a um, small, um, such a lightweight system, you might not want to have all that weight of the water additionally to it. So you try to keep it dry. Um, but um, other than that, I can't think of something that happens. And um, Snow, well, just don't build in winter, but we usually don't build in winter anyway. Okay, and then we have another question. So we know that you studied architecture in Delft, and now we wondered how your interest in digital fab fabrication started or how it developed. So how did you come to the point where you are right now? Ooh, um, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, 
That's uh, so I studied in Delft and there um, actually at the time and Delft was also quite uh, computational and digital. I did um, I did my master's with Hyperbody, uh, which doesn't exist in the meantime anymore because the professor retired. So Cass Osterhuis. But um, the idea of doing things computation with computational systems has been uh, has been part of that uh, master's program for me. And in that case, it wasn't called digital fabrication, but uh, file to factory. So we were dealing with a lot of um, princip paradigms of uh, how you do uh, CNC milling and other uh, and other sorts of systems. But this is also ten years ago, just so you know. Um, <laughs> this is um, kind of. Um, so back then, um, a little bit more uh, basic than now. Um, but if I'm really being honest, I think um, the part that uh, really drove me to it unconsciously somehow is I was part of, um, uh, when I finished my bachelor's, I took a year off and I, um, I was part of an interdisciplinary project that had nothing to do with architecture. It was building a car. Um, with um, a lot with other students, none of which architects, um, none of which female either, but um, <laughs> really uh, where I was really the odd one out. Um, but uh, what we did was build a, um, a lightweight um, race solar uh, race car. Um, and I think that's where, um, where all of this began a little bit or came together. The fact that you really need to work together with other, um, with, other specialists from other um, from other disciplines, but uh, really this idea of building lightweight, of using composites or using textile processes or, or um, being precise about your molding because actually aerodynamics makes a uh, it makes a big difference uh, for that. So I, I think it was the first time that I thought, okay, you know. Um, we need to be a little bit smarter about this. We need digital tools. We need uh, 3D models. We need to do this um, better um, because other industries were already doing that a lot more. So being exposed to that kind of um, made me fascinated with this. And then having the master's program that incidentally did a lot of the computational things uh, helped as well. Okay, and another question in the chat. Um, thank you for the enlightening lecture, enlightening lecture. You showed us very nice forms and text textures. Do you have ideas for everyday situation constructions, everyday life architecture? Well, um, everyday life architecture has to change because we cannot, uh, we cannot build um, the way we do now, so we really need to be uh, more materially efficient, um, meaning maybe that we need to let go of the box, um, <laughs> or at the very least, that we need to functionally grade that box. And if we want to functionally grade that box, then we need to um, come up with ways of building it. So really the way I see this project is actually that it's just a sort of um, the, well, the, the kind of uh, race car that demonstrates the craziness that you can do, but okay, sure, it's not applicable one-to-one. -one. Um, I think one of the examples that I can give from our group, it's not uh, my idea, it's our group, uh, is uh, really looking into floors um, because floors are really an integral uh, part of every building. And uh, if you do that in a way that uh, uses less material um, with funicular shapes, the usually you get this kind of ribbed uh, ribbed um, also this kind of ribbed uh, structure that is thin with uh, ribs in different directions um, so that you can start to imagine as a bit more of something that really makes an impact because it saves a lot of material and if you have high um, um, high or tall buildings that are more than 10 floors then you're really saving a lot of material there and those would also have complex geometries. Uh, you can think of, uh, you can think of, it, just to uh, to make an image in your head, you can know, you can think of uh, again the work of uh, Pierluigi Nervi. So you can think of those um, types of floors, um, and those are again uh, difficult to build. So these kind of methods um, are can be applied to these kind of standard um, situations. All right, thank you. Um, now it's, I think it's the last time we ask, are there more questions from the audience? Mm. 
I I would like to ask something. Um, maybe it's not really a question, more like uh, an idea to think about uh, for the future. Um, I work with the ceramics, and I was wondering if um, uh, you and your team ever considered to use this uh, type of technology of textile knitting technology to uh, fabricate some ceramic elements for architecture. Uh, I'm thinking th there are already in, in my field uh, textile used to create shapes uh, from clay. I mean, you, you can dip them in uh, clay slips and then you fire the pieces. And if, with your technology, I think you can create uh, some complex shapes that are uh, uh, repetitive. You can, uh, you can produce them in uh, uh, the necessary quantities, for example, for uh, exterior skins, envelopments of the buildings and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think it's a very nice suggestion. I'll be cheeky and I'll say that the cement paste is actually ceramic uh, <laughs> because uh, 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 concrete is actually a ceramic. Yes, that's but, true, um, but I'm talking was, about the fire. No, no, I know what you mean. I was just being cheeky. Um, so, uh, no, uh, that's a very, um, it's a very good suggestion, but uh, no, we haven't done this. Um, we have been mainly looking at uh, structural, uh, structural elements so far, but it's a very nice suggestion. Maybe we pick up and we can do something together, if you want, at some point. Yes, for sure. I'm, at the moment, I'm involved in, uh, in, a, in a doctoral thesis in uh, Bucharest, at the Architecture University in Bucharest. And uh, I noticed your, your uh, projects uh, a few years ago, and I'm, I'm thinking it's, it's a good way to combine what happened with the armadillo vault and what happened with the uh, knit candle. I mean, to obtain some kind of pieces that can interlock. And if you made them in porcelain, for example, it's going to be something uh, really uh, resistant to the environment, like uh, chemical resistance and things like that for the exterior. I don't know. Anyway, thank you very much for, for tonight's thank presentation. Thank you for the suggestion. OK, so thank you. Um everyone who was listening and thank you especially Mariana for the lecture and yeah we hope to see um, a lot of you next week um, we will have Philip Rahm as a lecturer and yeah have a good evening <laughs> thank you very much it was really a pleasure it was really nice to have you here and maybe we'll see each other when everything is over with Corona. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs>